Hey. Yeah. Good old Jay. All right. So we've been looking at these uh, messianic prophecies, and uh, this morning we're going to look at three once again. And these three are, are kind of connected. So it's interesting to me when you find these, how different prophets at different times write these prophecies. And obviously, they're all prophecies about Jesus and the coming Messiah. But how, you know, years apart, sometimes hundreds of years apart, they'll write similar prophecies and how they, how they all fit, fit together. So uh, this morning, we're just going to look at these and... And see what the Lord has for us here. So the first one that we'll notice is in Ruth chapter 4. Ruth chapter number 4 this morning. And uh, be a familiar passage. But this prophecy is the prophecy that the Messiah would be the kinsman redeemer. And redeem us through grace. So... The kinsman redeemer, understanding that the kins, kinsman rede, redeemer, boy, say that three times fast. <laughs> he's, uh, he's one who would pay another person's debt. So he would be a close family member. And so if that family member had debt, maybe they passed away and left a debt. This person would take it upon themselves to pay that debt. And just kind of free and clear. Free the, free the name, all right? So in Ruth chapter 4, notice this, beginning in verse number 1. Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there, and, and behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, such an one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down, and he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsman, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it beside thee. And I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Then said Boaz, what day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth, the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon the inheritance. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the manner of former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing. For to conform all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And this was a testimony in Israel. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. So again, the, the picture here of the, the kinsman redeemer. So we know from, from scripture that Boaz is is the kinsman redeemer for Ruth. Uh, there was another kinsman that was closer in relation who decided he couldn't do this. It would, it would mess up his finances, mess up his family. So Boaz says, I'm able to do this. I bought the land. And, and essentially, you know, he tells him later on, he's also taking Ruth to wife. And, and so he's becoming this uh, supplier, this this everything, essentially. He's, he's taking control of the situation, and everything now falls to him. So Boaz being the kinsman redeemer, Boaz also in the Old Testament is, a, is an example of Jesus. Because being the kinsman redeemer, that's the job of Jesus. Jesus is the one that can redeem us. Jesus was the only one that could pay our penalty, pay our debt. And so when he paid our debt, we became debt free. All right, so it's a picture of that. So Boaz is also, notice this, this is the connection between the three that we're going to look at today. Boaz is the great grandfather of King David. So again, you know the story, and, and Boaz passed down through the generation, and, and so his, his great grandson is King David. Now, in the eyes of Israel, there's no greater king than David. 
And so they all look to David, they all would look back to David, but the prophecy is here, the bulk of the prophecy, if you will, is in verse 4, where it says, And I thought to advise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants, and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me, that I may know, for there is none to redeem it besides thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. So it doesn't sound like much, but this is the prophecy. So again, talking about that kinsman redeemer. So when we're thinking about the, the kinsman redeemer, where do we see that prophecy fulfilled? So look at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter number 1. Now a lot of these, sometimes you'll read it and you just kind of skate over it thinking, well, how is that a prophecy? But when you look at it all together, you can see the prophecy unfold. Okay, so Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 67. Notice this. This is the birth of, of John the Baptist. Verse 67. And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and, what? Redeemed his people. So there's the fulfillment of that prophecy in Ruth. And hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember the holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we be de being delivered out of the hand of the enemies might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way. Now notice this. This is the father of John the Baptist. So we know the story, you know, he was, he was made mute, he couldn't speak, and so he's writing on a tablet until the baby's born. And you know, they were told the baby would be called John. All prophetic promises. So when, when this happens and John is born, they come eight days later to circumcise him, and that's when they would name the child. So all of the priests, priests come and they say, you know, we're going to name the baby Zacharias, and the mother says, no, his name's going to be John. And you know the story. Well, there's none in your family named John. And so they motion to Zacharias and they say, well, what's the name going to be? And he speaks and he says, John. And everybody's in awe. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit came upon him at that time and he begins to prophesy of the coming of Jesus Christ saying that he is the Redeemer. He's that promised kinsman Redeemer that we had back in Ruth. And then he, he speaks a prophecy about his son, John. He says he will be the forerunner for this prophet, for this king, for this Messiah. He will be a prophet among prophets, and he will go and he will prepare the way for this great Messiah. So we have kind of really two, two prophecies being fulfilled here, here because we have the prophecy of Jesus being the kinsman redeemer, and we have the prophecy of John the Baptist. So kind of amazing how those two go together. Turn, if you will, to Romans chapter 5. So we see this in a couple of different places in the, in the New Testament. So Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> oh, my pages are stuck together. All right, Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 7. You probably know these verses pretty well if you, you spend any time witnessing to people. The Bible says in verse 7, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth, or proved, his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So what's it talking about there? It's talking about our redemption. It's talking about our salvation. It's talking about our debt being paid. So that kinsman redeemer, Jesus the Messiah, he had to come and he had to die in order to pay our debt. What was our debt? Well, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's our debt. We owe a debt of death. 
Can you imagine that? I mean, just imagine having that hanging over your head. And those people that live without Christ, they have that debt hanging over their head. It's a debt that either they must pay or they allow Jesus to pay. Now think about that. And our kinsman redeemer, our Messiah came, our Jesus came and paid that debt for us. Now look at Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1. It's interesting sometimes when you start putting these together and you see how they all work. So Ephesians chapter number 1, look at verse 7. Notice it says here, In whom we have redemption, the kinsman's redeemer, through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace. Do you remember the prophecy? The kinsman redeemer would, would come and redeem us by his grace. That was the prophecy. It was grace for Boaz to redeem Ruth and to redeem the land that they had. It was grace for Boaz to, to make him or make her his wife. It was all grace. He was a picture of Jesus Christ. It was a picture of this prophecy and how Jesus would pay our debt. And not only would he pay our debt, but he would pay it in full. You and I have nothing to pay. Ever. I mean, that ought to make even a Baptist shout. I mean, if you really think about it, because there are so many people out there that want you to believe that, yes, you can be saved, and yes, you can ask Jesus to come into your life, but if you sin, then you've got to get saved again. Well, I'm so thankful that that's not true, because I'd have to get saved probably several times a day. I mean, really, think about it. Just drive through Springfield. You're going to have to get saved 10 times between home and Walmart. I mean, <laughs> you know, if that were true, where's the hope? I mean, where's the peace? Where's the security? Where's the redemption? Because that was the whole purpose of the picture of that kinsman redeemer was that I would come in and I would pay that debt and it would be done. There would be no more debt. Jesus being our kinsman redeemer, by grace, his blood has saved us and we have no more debt. Our debt with God is gone. Amen to that. I mean, we are free from our debt. How many have, uh, how many have ever listened to Dave Ramsey? You, know, you get him on the radio, somebody gets on there and they say, Dave, I'm debt free. All right, you ready to shout? <laughs> you know, Why are they ready to shout? Because they're debt free. I mean, listen, folks, we need to be ready to shout. <laughs> when somebody talks about Jesus paying our debt, we need to be ready to shout because we are debt-free, and that's better than anything Dave Ramsey can get for you. Amen to that. So not only do we see this kinsman redeemer who's going to redeem us by grace, but take your Bibles this morning and turn to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. As I said, all of these three that we're looking at today are connected, and they're connected through David. So I want you to see this. We know that Boaz was the great-grandfather of David, but the next prophecy that we see in 2 Samuel chapter 7, we see here that the Messiah would be a descendant of David. The Messiah would be a descendant of David. 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 12. And when thy days be fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now notice that. That's a simple phrase, but it's an important phrase. I will establish his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him and the rod of men with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever. There it is again. Before thee, thy throne shall be established forever. 
How many times did he say? Forever. I mean, this, this to me, it's an amazing prophecy. Because, you know, David is being told here, your kingdom, your seed, your throne, it's going to be settled, it's going to be there, it's going to be in place forever. Now let me ask you a question. Where's the throne of David? Does it even exist? Where's the kingdom of David? Uh, well, is it Israel? Why, you wouldn't really call that the kingdom of David nowadays, would you? I mean, think of where, where is it? It's in Jesus. I mean, he is the kingdom of David. He is the throne of David. He is everything in this prophecy. He says right here, I shall set up seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels. He says, I will establish his kingdom forever. It will never end. Also, turn over, if you will, to the book of Isaiah. Now, notice this. <clears throat> This is one of those prophecies, as I said, is written by different prophets at different times, sometimes hundreds of years apart. In Isaiah chapter 11, let me get my pages to turn fast enough. Notice what it says here in verse 1. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Well, who's Jesse? The father of David. Now, hold on. This is Isaiah. This prophecy came to David. David came before Isaiah. And now Isaiah is saying, out of Jesse will come the root for this great prophet, this great Messiah. So he's going to come, he's going to be a descendant of David. Even Isaiah is saying this. One more place, look at this. Jeremiah 23. Now, I, I know we don't often go to these, these prophetical books, and sometimes they're hard to find, but Jeremiah 23, notice what it says here, beginning in verse 5. All right, so, behold... The days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. Now Isaiah said the branch is going to come out of Jesse. And Jeremiah is saying David is going to raise out of David a righteous branch. And a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called. The Lord, our righteousness. All in caps. That's, that's God. That's Jesus. Now, I mean, think about this. This is 400 years after David's reign. 400 years between David's reign and Jeremiah's prophecy. And Jeremiah says there's going to come a king out of David. And when this king comes, Judah is going to be in peace and Israel is going to, going to live safely. Now, now, we understand that all of this takes place. Now, follow me on this because this is where it gets confusing. After the rapture, after the final battle, when Jesus returns and sets up his millennial kingdom, this is what it's talking about. His kingdom forever is going to be peace with Israel, peace with Judah, and, and they're going to reign in safety. They're going to have peace and safety. And now, well, Obviously, we know that didn't happen the first time he came, did it? I mean, he didn't sit on a throne when he came the first time. In fact, he said, I didn't come to rule. <laughs> but when we think about this, we think about everything, all of these prophecies. These, these three prophecies together are the same. That David would be a descendant, or that Jesus would be a descendant of David. So where do we see the fulfillment? We'll turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. And aren't you all glad that I did the work for you? <laughs> Matthew chapter 1, look at verse 1. 
right there. The book of the generation of who? Jesus. Jesus Christ. So what we are about to see is what we call the legal lineage of Jesus. So we also see a lineage, I think it's in, is it in Luke? Where we see the lineage through Mary. Okay, so we have the legal lineage here of, of Jesus. Now notice this, the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Did you see that? That is a direct fulfillment of those three prophecies that we just read in the Old Testament. So when they come, when they, it's kind of like, I, I kind of put it this way. When you go to the county clerk or, or the records office and you get someone's birth certificate, what does it say on that birth certificate? The child's name, the mother's name, the father's name. Sometimes some older ones might have the grandparents listed there in different generations of the family. This is what we have here in Matthew chapter 1. We have the, the Hebrew or the, the uh, Israelite Jewish version of that, if you will. This is Jesus Christ being born, and they're saying he's the son of David. A direct fulfillment of that prophecy. Now turn to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. I know, we use our Bibles a lot. That's good. All right, Acts chapter 15, notice verse 15. <clears throat> and to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written. Now, anytime the Bible says, as it is written, or it is written, you need to take note of that because it's saying this is a prophecy. This is something that has been foretold. Notice verse 16. After this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. So what are they saying here? Jesus is going to return, and not only will he return, but he will rebuild the tabernacle of David, setting up his kingdom. You see this? So he's saying the Messiah is going to be a descendant of David, and when this Messiah comes, when this time comes, everything is going to be restored just like the Davidic kingdom. Now when you think about that, you think about everything that David was promised. You know, the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. Well, this is going to be God himself. I mean, hey, what a picture, what a time, what, a, what an amazing event that you and I will be able to witness. I mean, we're going to be right there, folks. We're going to be right alongside with them. I mean, what an amazing time. And, and I think about people that, that read these prophecies and, ah, that doesn't mean anything. When you have 400 years between prophecies and they agree, and then you go thousands of years later when Jesus is born and the prophecies agree, how can you deny the word of God? You know, people say, oh, well, that Bible, you know, was written by so many men over so many years. How can it be? How can it be the word of God? Because it all agrees. I mean, how could all of these authors say the same thing? It's impossible. You couldn't get two authors today to agree on a paragraph. Let alone the word of God. One last prophecy this morning. Not only would the Messiah be a descendant of David, but notice this, turn to Psalm, Psalm 110. Again, a Psalm of David, but I want you to think about this because David is, is the one writing this in Psalm 110 and uh, beginning in verse 1, we see the Messiah would be greater than David. So that's the prophecy. The Messiah would be greater than David. Verse 1. And the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness. From the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. 
the Lord hath sworn and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now that's a, that's a throwback. Now think about this. David is writing this psalm, and he's writing a psalm to the Lord about the Lord. I mean, figure that one out. <laughs> I'm going to write this about you, God, because you're so wonderful, you're so amazing, you are all-powerful. And he's writing this, and he says, when this, when this prophet comes, when this Messiah comes, he will be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, without going into too much detail, you know, Melchizedek was that, that king that, that Abraham gave tithes to, and he's also, he was called the, the king of Salem or the king of peace. And he was an Old Testament picture of Jesus Christ. Some even say a Christophany. So an appearance of Jesus Christ. Because Abraham gave tithes to him. And his priesthood, he came from nowhere. He had no father, no mother. He just appeared. His, his reign is forever. Figure that one out. Nobody knows where he came from, where he went. But, I mean, just an amazing picture here. And David says, this prophet, this, this Messiah, when he comes, will be like this Melchizedek. And his priesthood is going to last forever. So, what is David talking about, and where do we see the fulfillment? Matthew 22. Matthew chapter 22. One of these days we might just do a study on Melchizedek. But that, <laughs> that's one of those, what? <laughs> what, what, what? Who's Melchizedek? Yeah, well, it's an interesting study. But All right, Matthew chapter 22. Notice this fulfillment of prophecy in verse 41. This is Jesus speaking. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And they say unto him, The son of David. And he saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord? Saying, The Lord saith unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then called him Lord, how is he his son? See that? So I know it's confusing. But listen to what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is actually referring to Psalm 110. When David said, Lord, the Lord will reign until you make your enemies your footstool. Well, what's Jesus saying here? He asked the Pharisees, who's the Messiah? Who am I? Oh, you're the son of David. How am I the son of David when David said I'm greater than he is? Do you see that? That's what he's saying. David in Psalm 110 says, I am greater than he. Because he called me Lord. So how am I his son? Now that, that'll get your head scratching. <laughs> yeah, I mean, can you imagine what the Pharisees are thinking? Who does this guy think he is? Now again, and we say this often in here, would they not have understood? These are the Pharisees. They study the law. They study these prophecies. In fact, many of them, that's all their job is, is, is to study prophecy. They know the Psalms. They know Isaiah. They know Jeremiah. They know all of these prophecies of the Messiah because they're watching for the Messiah to come to deliver them from Rome. And when he comes, they say, it's not possible. Yeah, I and mean, I think we discussed that when we talked about the ministry of Jesus. It's a, it's a purposeful blinding because if they had recognized him at that moment as the Messiah, would he have needed to die? Yeah, he would have had to set up his kingdom because they would have all recognized him as king and they would have rebelled against Rome and... There are a lot of pieces in place here because the, the, the complete prophecy had not yet been fulfilled. It, it's fulfilled in pieces. And so he's telling them here, I'm greater than David. So you know the prophecy. You know that the Messiah is going to be greater than David. Well, that's me. I'm here. All right. Notice 1 Corinthians. Or, I'm sorry. Go to Acts first. 
Acts chapter 2. We have a few of these to look at real quick. Acts chapter 2, notice verse 34. Verse 34. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. What's that a reference to? Psalm 110. Imagine that. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Did you see that? So again, here we have the same prophecy. And they're saying, you know, sit on my right hand till I make your, my, your enemies your footstool. And he's saying, that same Jesus is the one that you killed, you crucified. So who's he speaking to? The religious crowd. And he's saying, this Messiah came and you killed him. Can you imagine? <laughs> All these prophets, all, all these priests, all these, the, this religious crowd, they're all looking for the Messiah. And, and along comes uh, who's it? Luke. That was probably Paul that actually wrote it or said it. But saying, the Messiah came. You've been watching for him. You're looking for him. And you killed him. I mean, what a, what a slap in the face. And so they're just, they're, they're beside themselves. They can't figure this out. Now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Notice this. We've got two more places to turn and we'll be done. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 25. Notice this. For he, speaking of that Messiah, speaking of Jesus, he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. There's that reference again. The last enemy, now notice this, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. I, I love that statement. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, when shall, then shall the son, of, the son him also himself, boy, I can't even see today, be subject unto him that put all things under him that God may be in or all in all. So, so notice this. He says, you've got the prophecy, sit on my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So make all your enemies come under you. He says, the final enemy to be destroyed is death. Let me ask you a question. Put your thinking caps on. When did the Messiah defeat death? When he walked out of the tomb. He's defeated death. He walked out of that tomb and said, death has no hold on me. In fact, he says to the devil, where, death, where is your sting? You, you have no control over me. You have, no, you have nothing to use against me because I have already defeated that enemy. Well, not only that, but that enemy was defeated in you and I when we come to Jesus Christ. Yes, we have to face a physical death. Now, now listen to me. And this is sometimes confusing for people. Even if the rapture happened right now, this moment, at some point between here and there, you and I, this body, would have to face a physical death. Because this physical body cannot enter into heaven. Because it's corrupt. So this physical body has to die somehow. And then we get our eternal bodies where we live forever and death is literally defeated in every one of our lives. What an amazing picture. That's what he's saying here. That final enemy is no longer an enemy. He's been defeated. That ought to make you rejoice. Even though we face a physical death and we're going to be separated from our loved ones, it's only for a short time. And you know, I often think about this. We have, we have family members that we know are in heaven and we think about how much we miss them and oftentimes how much we want them to be with us. But, you know, for us, it might be years. And it seems like forever. But you re realize in heaven, there's no time. To them, it's that quick. I mean, I just got here. You're right behind me. I mean, you imagine what that reunion is going to be like. It'll be as if we never left them. What an amazing picture. 
All right, one last place. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 5. Hebrews 4, verse 5. Notice this. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entereth not in because of unbelief. Again he limiteth a certain day, saying, In David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he hath also, or also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. So there's coming a day. Death has been defeated. Our enemies have been defeated by this Messiah by this prophesied Messiah. And when we enter, the Bible says, when we enter into his rest, there's coming a day when all of our work will cease. How many say amen to that? I mean, it's been a long week. I mean, I'm physically drained. I'm physically tired. But there's coming a day when there will be no work. We enter that rest because our Messiah has come. He has defeated all of our enemies. He has defeated death. He has defeated everything that can hurt us, everything that can hinder us. He's defeated everything that can stop us from serving him. Now, now I want you to get this. You and I, as a child of God, have victory over everything. We just need to choose to live there. See, that's the problem. We let sin get the best of us. We let this world get the best of us. We let our thoughts get the best of us. We let our emotions get the best of us. We have victory over all of that. Our enemies, all of our enemies have been defeated. You say, oh, but the devil and his demons are still here. Yes, they're still here. But they're living a defeated life. And in reality, they know that they've been defeated. They know that they're going to lose in the end. They know they can't beat him. We already have the victory. It's time that we live like it. You know, why do we look at these, these prophecies? Why do we look at these, the, these Old Testament uh, pictures of Christ so that we know he's real? We can see the victory through these prophecies. We can see how thousands of years ago his coming was prophesied and then at his birth it was fulfilled. And it's just amazing how we can see this and realize that Everything in this book is truth. And we can take God at his word. And when he says we have victory, then we have victory. And we need to choose to live like it. That's why we look at these prophecies, so that we'll understand how wonderful and amazing our Lord is. Man, our Redeemer, our kinsman Redeemer, from the house and lineage of David, but greater than David. As I said, all of Israel looks at David as their greatest king until the Messiah comes. Now, they're still looking for him. They're still watching. They're, they're still searching the prophecies, and we're going, um, he was here, and you killed him. <laughs> but that was all part of the prophecy. What an amazing God. <laughs> To put all that together just to save us. Father, we thank you, Lord, today for this time. We thank you for these prophecies that we can see of, in, in the Old Testament of your coming and just the amazing way that you reveal those prophecies to us. And Lord, help, help us as your children each and every day to live in the victory that you've given us through the cross and through your shed blood. Father, we thank you again for this time. We pray you be with pastor as he comes this morning bring the message to our lives that it might be exactly what we need to serve you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.